morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on when you are watching this broadcast. I am Christine Pettit, and I'd love to welcome you to our first edition of High Spirits, where we will explore the energy around us. I'm joined today by my guest, Jim Bond, and the two of us are going to discuss the general change in the United States, in our society, and the movement of our culture from a religious, organized, religious-based culture to more of a spiritual, seeking, open, undefined religious culture in the United States. And Jim is here as an expert because he started not only with his upbringing, which he will tell us a little bit about, but in college, he started from a real religious theological um, background in terms of his standpoint. And then once he became thinking and a growing individual, made some different choices from the ones he was raised with. So I wanted to discuss with Jim and all of you a little bit of how we got to where we are in terms of the religious temperature or climate in our country. Welcome, Jim. Thank you for being with us today. So if you could give us a little background um, on yourself so that we understand where you're coming from and what you think brought you to your belief system today. Well, uh, <clears throat> I guess I would begin with saying that I was born in a um, working class family in East Hartford. Uh, we were a Catholic family uh, in an atmosphere that was very Catholic. Uh, East Hartford was a town and it was probably 60 or 70 percent Catholic. So I, when I grew up, I always thought that everybody in the world was Catholic. Um, I went on to uh, parochial school. Uh, I went to a Benedictine college, undergraduate college. Which means? The, the Benedictine order taught it. And I literally took theology courses from Benedictine priests, monks. Monks and priests. And, uh, and then I went on to grad school uh, at Notre Dame. Uh, and uh, centered in uh, um, political philosophy, really, um, and studying of the ancients, the ancient Greeks and Roman philosophers, right up through to contemporary uh, philosophers. And uh, while I started out uh, in a, a Catholic framework, um, my education kind of led me uh, in other directions to become more of a skeptic and more of a, of a, uh, a, a seeker after truth, you might say. A more philosophical uh, perspective. Uh, and that's where we are. Okay. So that philosophical seeking perspective, is that what led you to major and focus your studies on philosophy? Is that, was that yeah. present in you throughout your life? Yeah, actually, that's an interesting point because when I was young, I, I was very religious mm -hmm. uh, and uh, was looking for the one thing needful, as somebody once put it. Uh, Say that again, the one thing. The one thing needful. Needful. Mm. And that was the focus, really, of my, uh, my intellectual life. Uh, and that's what brought me uh, along the path uh, through theology. I mean, I read the, the great theologians like Thomas Aquinas and uh, St. Augustine and so forth. Um, but I also read uh, a lot of the, um, the pagans, as they're called, uh, Plato and Aristotle. And one of the things that astonished me, as a good education should, is that when I began to read Aristotle, Plato, and, and, and uh, so many of these great minds of the ancient world, I discovered that there was an entirely different world that interpreted itself in an entirely different way than my upbringing had given me. And that awakened my thirst for knowledge. So the interpretation of self is that something that you were focused on when you were in these studies? Did you, were you aware that you were looking at your own belief system, or were you just there to kind of learn history of philosophy? Or I, I wouldn't say that I was pursuing uh, uh, an inquiry into the self, because the self is a modern term. That's a 19th century term, uh, a Freudian term, especially. Um, no, the, the ancient... Uh, philosophy is uh, philosophers were aiming at seeking the truth, finding out the truth, uh, and then examining it in in uh, uh, in in as meticulous a way as they could. 
and uh, that truth uh, oftentimes would be uh, something you would see in the speech of, of, of people you talk to in the, uh, in the street, um, what they felt about, uh, what they thought about uh, the politics of the day, what was just, what was unjust, should we go to war, should we stay out of war? Um, these are major issues that were discussed, and um, to get those issues answered, you had to really kind of think about what the, your fundamental principles were. And that's really what we were pursuing as a, a, in a philosophical way. So the fundamental principles that we are each raised with, that we gather either from parents or from teachers or religious leaders as we're, as we're growing, do you see a change in the overall belief system since you were studying then versus today? Do you, do you see a, an examples of a change? Is there a, a shift that you've noticed even in your lifetime? Well, sure. There's been a profound shift. Um, what we are seeing is, frankly, um, the disintegration of Western civilization. Um, the, the predicted disintegration, sure. may we and add, right? I, I guess one shortcut way to that uh, is to look at um, Nietzsche, who was probably the uh, one philosopher in the 19th century that understood where we are 150 years ago. Uh, and one of the things that he pointed out was the phenomenon of the death of God that took place roughly in the 15th and 16th centuries. Uh, and what he meant by that was twofold. One is a religious sense, a moral sense, and a second sense, which was a philosophical sense. The philosophical sense meaning that without a foundation in an absolute truth, then we are cast adrift in trying to find a way to, to accomplish uh, uh, any commonsensical or any kind of rational way in which to guide our lives. Uh, and uh, the moral sense is, is profound because with the death of God uh, comes um, along that line of thinking, uh, the, uh, the removal of, of a moral foundation for our lives. And as Dostoevsky uh, said um, in that connection, uh, when nothing is forbidden, then everything is permitted. And we're seeing the outcome of that uh, conclusion uh, practically every day uh, in our society today. And there are so many examples that I know we've discussed um, where you can see those those shifts in belief systems and thinking. Um, but what I'm what I'm particularly concerned with, um, or have been noticing myself um, as I studied uh, the sociology of religion was something that I focused on because I was noticing a change myself. I also grew up, uh, I grew up in Bristol and when they said the church, capital T, it meant Catholic and everyone seemed to agree that that's what we were talking about. So I also grew up thinking everyone was Christian obviously, right, it, or Jewish. That's about, that was about as far as my knowledge went there. Or, and Christian really meant Catholic. When my family transitioned from the Catholic way that they were all raised as well to Mormonism, that opened my mind uh, to, oh, wait a minute, there are other lenses, there are other ways to look at this. I think over time, um, I've noticed that spirituality is on the rise just verbally like you're saying you get your kind of some of your knowledge and cues from the people you meet on the street the people you discuss things with um, I know you may have heard this as well when you ask someone what religion they are they'll say well I'm spiritual but I'm not religious okay. um, that type of person has been dubbed the SBNR by researchers and they're on the rise. Spiritual but not religious is, is becoming its own mm -hmm. semi-unorganized category. Right. Um, and a quarter of the U.S. population today is religiously unaffiliated. And I find that to be somewhat a large percentage, but not surprising to me, just because I've you know sort of watched people further remove themselves from their religious, organized religious upbringings. Um, 
one example of the data I think uh, that we can see for proof is not only these conversations, but the churches that are being shuttered, um, the attendance numbers going down, the income is not the same as it was for many of these churches. Um, we're seeing priests having to major in business to become uh, priests, where religion was the only study or to my knowledge, mm -hmm. um, and business and running a church has become really a larger focus, I think, than some of the theological pursuits in the past for some of the religious leaders. Um, so this question, you know, as that change happens, the question arises, what are we replacing it with? Um, and is that something that you can speak to? Do you think that, um, that God hole, as it has been referred to, um, what do you think it's being replaced with? Well, I think there's a great deal of confusion as to what it can be replaced with because there isn't any clearly compelling and overwhelming religion that is drawing people. Um, people are being drawn in different directions. Um, I think that the absence of a comprehensive, all interpreting, uh, kind of view of the world is pretty much absent from the West. It is not necessarily absent from the Middle East, as Correct. we know, because Islam the represented the, yeah. the Islam, uh, not so much the Far East, because the Far East is has a different perspective perspective mm -hmm. on, on their relationship uh, to uh, to the universe, if you like. Um, but the, the, the Muslim religion is attractive to some people because it provides an answer for everything like the Catholic Church used to do. Um, I see right now that the people that are seeking uh, or the people who are religious but not, the are not religious but, but spiritual yeah. um, are, are trying to find some way in, in, in which to articulate meaning in life um, that is not being provided to them by a religious institution. And so there's a, a lot of um, quest and searching for something that will give some satisfaction and, and some understanding of why we're here and why we're guided to do this, that, or the other thing. So let me, let me ask you, if we look at the changing culture of religion, and we will focus on the United States because we can't really speak to these other regions as well, just with our personal experience. Um, but I'm wondering what you think the, in terms of um, connection or worship, for instance, normally a religious would, religious theology would organize and have meetings, et cetera. And Karl Marx talked about the uh, when people feel that they have a religious experience, when they feel God, people thought that they were connecting to the energy of, of their leader or the Lord. Or, and he looked at it as all of our energies are together. And because we're together, we're getting this experience of God. Do, do you remember that line? Well, of I studied Marx, and I, I would not put Marx in the category of uh, any kind of religion, believe me. Uh, in fact, he I don't think he it, would have either. He <laughs> considered it the opiate of the people. So Correct. Uh, he was not a friend of religion. I think the analogy, to go back at something you were, you were uh, approaching earlier about what, what type of organizing principle might there be for people who are trying to be spiritual. Well, I'm not an expert in that, but I, I do have an analogy, and that is the invention of uh, the printing press was uh, a revolutionary, uh, epical event because what it meant was that the Catholic Church, which controlled the interpretation of Christianity because it controlled literacy, they were the only ones that had the Bible, and Catholics, practicing Catholics, were not expected to read the Bible. Uh, they were expected to listen to what the priest told them the Bible meant. And with the invention of the printing press, all of a sudden, Bibles were available to increasingly anyone. And as some philosophers have pointed out who went through the religious wars of the 1500s, uh, that was a big 
tragedy, you know, in a sense uh, that the printing press uh, uh, did that because now all of a sudden everybody became his own priest. And, uh, and we could say use the his because that's the way it was in those days. Right. Um, but what it also meant was that the unified mother church fragmented into multiple uh, Protestant sects. And then the Protestant sects fragmented into multiple Protestant sects so that you had the friends who would go, had a completely different religious practice where the friends would go into the, the, uh, uh, the services and sit and not say a word unless somebody was moved by, and they have a phrase for it, but it was a, a move to, to speak the, the word that came to them from God. Uh, and otherwise, everybody would stay for a while and then leave. I mean, that, that's how individualized the various sects became, and that's what I'm driving at. I think that spirituality is very much an individual thing, and the people that feel spirituality moves in that direction will find fellow followers to go in, go in that direction and so forth, multiple directions. And an important distinction, I know, in, in, I think it was like 1528 when, just kidding, it was exactly 1528, I wrote it down, when Luther, and the, during the Protestant Reformation that you're referring to. Um, Back the 95 it, Theses to the door. Yes, right. right. And actually during that time, um, spiritualism rose up as an organized alternative, actually. Um, and it has a lot of similarities to the spiritualistic movement of today. The difference being in that time during the Protestant Reformation, people still held to that one general belief system, still believed the Bible was doctrine, still followed a semi-Christian belief system while having a much more individual connection to their higher power, God, or whatever. Um, and I think today's spiritualism is a little bit different because they don't necessarily all have to be Christian. You can be spiritual and come from a different religious theological background. Um, and it's not as much of an organized approach to that individual connection with your maker, your higher power, the whatever term you would use. But at the time, they would have definitely used the term God. <laughs> um, so very individualistic and trusting your own inner experience. And I think that did arise from literally interpreting the Bible for yourself. Um, I know my mother, even in the 50s, the 60s, uh, many sermons or well, not sermons, but the Catholic approach was to do it in Latin. You know, if you don't understand Latin, don't worry about it. We'll tell you what it means. Um, and I think that is just a, a very different approach that people these days with the access to the internet, this information age, I think it's changed so many things in terms of how we approach religion, how we approach our personal spirituality. But also, I think that it changed salvation also being, um, people started to believe that their salvation could be a personal relationship instead of having to go through a priest to be saved or not go to hell or however you want to um, look has, at that. That has a really quite a, a, a long history going back to the Protestant Reformation. It does. It does. So, yeah. Right. Um, so I feel that the, um, the idea of the inner knowing is kind of the topic that I am trying to get to with this entire series is when you take this organized religion, when you take even the Bible out of, you know, the basis for your beliefs, where are you drawing from? You know, not for you personally, but what do you think? Well, if, what do you want to share about your own personal belief system today? compared after the seeking in this lifetime of research and deep knowledge and, and really you're a thinker, you know, where did you end up? If you don't mind telling us, do you still hold that 
religious background? Are you no, somewhere I don't, in the middle? I don't consider myself religious. Mm -hmm. uh, I I uh, consider myself uh, let's call it a seeker. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm interested in exploring avenues that are going to teach me things that are going to uh, tell me things that uh, uh, help me to understand life, the life around us, the conditions of life around us. Uh, as, as, as best as we can. And that's really what philosophy is about, is trying to understand the conditions into which you were born and, and how to understand them in relationship to other understandings that have existed, such as the first beginning that I made when I uh, went off to college and discovered that there were people like Aristotle and Plato and Socrates who lived quite finely and perfectly comfortably, uh, in a sense, uh, without ever having heard of Christ, because Christ hadn't been born yet. And I, I found that to be a pretty astonishing thing. So the idea of being able to discover things uh, in my own light uh, with, uh, without reference to uh, revelation is, um, is, a, is a path that I've taken. Thank you. So I would love to continue this conversation. And we actually plan to. We're going to do one more episode together. Because I would also like to talk about the information age and the need for kind of hard data and science taking over um, and commerce taking over. I think the mark of a society and their values has been through, through time, their highest buildings can usually be equated with the highest value system. And for years and centuries and, de you know, Churches were the highest point in a town. Um, you know, you go to Charleston, South Carolina, it is the holy city, and nothing is built higher than that, that church steeple height. You can't have more than five-story buildings because they'll dwarf those steeples, and that's their value. They value those. So New York City, you can see their value visibly in commerce. So with that change of data, with that change of need for proof, I wanted to discuss what you ended up doing with your career and how you you saw that change for uh, proof coming up more. Um, so that's the topic that we'll explore next. Well, that does it for our first episode of High Spirits, exploring the energy around us. I am grateful to our guest, Jim Bond, and very much looking forward to part two, where we can discuss further his beliefs about energy, intuition, and how they have shown up in his professional life. Thank you so much for being with us. We'll see you again. Nick Augustino right here at the East Side Restaurant. We always have the complete full dinner menu. Knockwurst, bratwurst, sour broughton, potato pancakes, red cabbage, rice pudding, cream pies, all the desserts that Germany had to offer. I always do something different. Yes, I do. I brought seafood to the beer garden at the East Side Restaurant. East Side Restaurant, your German destination restaurant in Connecticut. Tiggy talking, tiggy talking, hi, hi, hi.